Hi guys and welcome back to the 25th episode of the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hello everybody. And me, Jan Wegener. We've got another giveaway time. Some of you who have been watching along or follow me know that I've got a brand new book out all about hummingbirds. It's actually not even out yet in North America. It's coming out July 19th. And in order to show our appreciation for you guys, for watching, for commenting, for liking the videos, and even for picking up our pro sets, we want to give a copy away for several of the next episodes. So if you want to win this book, stay tuned to this episode. At the end of the episode, we're going to tell you how you can win it. So Glenn, now I'm like the only person in the world who hasn't gotten their R7 yet, but I know you've gotten yours. So I'm really curious to see, and especially hear, your first thoughts about the camera, how it feels and what it's like. I uh, was very lucky to get one uh, a few days ago. I want to say a big thank you to Camera Canada for making sure that you guys got me this right away. I really appreciate that. And for all the Canadians out there, if you're looking for some new camera gear, be sure to check out Camera Canada. And I've been out shooting with it a couple times. It, it feels quite different than the R5. It's a lot smaller. It's definitely got some ergonomic changes, which I'm not sure how I feel about yet. Um, <laughs> One of the big differences is that normally on, if you were like, you know, 5D, 7D, R5, R6, R3, you've got the back wheel kind of down here. And on this camera, they've moved the wheel up. It feels smaller. I would have preferred if it was literally exactly the same as the R5, but it was an R7, just with the crop different sensor. That just makes life so much easier when you're switching back and forth between bodies. So personally, selfishly, I would have preferred that. And there's no battery grip available either. So an already small camera kind of has to stay pretty small, which probably doesn't make it easier, but it doesn't seem like you're hating the body. It's different, but you might even yeah. actually like the wheel at the top. Yeah, totally. I think it's nothing that you couldn't get used to pretty easily. And if you were using it as a second body, if you're using it as your main body, for sure, you'd get used to it after a shoot or two, 5D and the 7D were essentially the exact same body, right? So I just sort of assumed that Canon would do that here as well, and they really haven't done that. They've done something quite different. Yeah, I think the name definitely caused some confusion because it may have suggested something that the camera isn't. So we had some sort of skewed expectations, but I know there's a lot of YouTube channels that never really take the camera into the field, but that's not us. So have you done any shooting with it yet? The specifications of this camera are enough to get you enticed and excited, right? It's it's a 1.6 crop body, just like the 7D or the 90D was, and it's got 33 megapixels. So it's, it's amazing to have the R5 that can shoot in crop mode, but you're really only at, what is it, 17, 18 megapixels. So all of a sudden, the, the promise is there if everything delivers to have a lot more megapixels on those subjects that are a little further away. And for me, who does like mostly field photography and little warblers and little tanagers up in the trees, I wouldn't mind some of those megapixels, but the camera's got to deliver. And of course, the other really exciting buzz around this camera is that they say that it's got basically the same autofocus system as the R3, which is like, whoa, what's going on there? This super expensive camera, they put it in a quite affordable camera so that's pretty exciting and the fact that it can shoot 30 frames a second all sounds pretty good right so is it too good to be true or can it deliver from your first kind of impression shooting some birds and what birds have you been photographing with it yet i think you have to set your expectations accordingly they've given you a lot of functionality you've got the eye detect is capable of doing 30 frames a second in mirrorless mode but they didn't give you the buffer <laughs> so yeah, you can shoot 30 frames a second for about a second and then you buffer out. So, and that's, you know, there's some options you can do to kind of enhance that. So you can shoot in C raw, make the file sizes a little bit smaller. You definitely have to have the fastest SD cards available. And, but if you're shooting at 30 frames a second, you've got about, I think 1.3, one, I think I was in C raw, I was getting up to maybe around 50. I could check right now around 50. Um, or 46 shots that I could take before the buffer would fill. So if you do the math, that's a second and a half. So if you're really, some action's really happening, birds are fighting or flying or doing something, and you just give it, boom, you fill the buffer. So you kind of have to, like when I was in the field the other day, I was kind of like trying to shoot in these little bursts just to kind of like keep taking shots but not buffer out. So it's, it's sort of like, a, it's almost like a tease. Like it can do that, but just for a little short amount of time. And then does it take a long time to clear because it's the SD cards or does that at least go off pretty quickly? 
I mean, like, so I was just on a big road trip shooting a ton. And I don't think I even like hardly buffered out my R5 once at all, right? So I'm so used to like no buffer even being in the equation. And immediately when I started shooting with this, I was like, oh yeah, I remember what this is all about. For the price point, the camera actually seems pretty good of all with some pretty crazy features. And I really hope I will actually get mine today or tomorrow. I'm always <laughs> looking down already in the driveway, seeing if that post truck will come and deliver <laughs> the camera. Cause it's actually hard to take delivery of a camera when you're only two or three nights in one spot and then you're moving on to the next spot. So we've been trying to time it that I'm a bit longer in this house. So hopefully I get it today or tomorrow. If I don't get it today or tomorrow, I'll be in big trouble because then the camera will arrive after I've already left. So we'll see how I go. And Glenn and I will obviously do another show where we properly share our impressions. We're going to share how we set up the camera and how we're going to sort of get around some of the shortcomings. And that will be coming up soon. And yeah, we're excited to use the camera and share our thoughts and impressions with you. And if you had to pick one or two things that you really like about the camera, what would that be? If you're a shooter who hasn't made the jump up into the mirrorless world, if you don't already shoot with an R5 or an R3, and you're still with like a 90D or a 7D or a 7D Mark II or a 5D or whatever, this is really exciting because probably, you know, you haven't made that jump for a reason. And it's probably the sort of pretty high price tag of those cameras. Mm -hmm. Now, Canon has an affordable mirrorless camera that has the eye detect tracking focus, which is just a game changing functionality. And it's got some other cool stuff. Like it's pretty cool that it can shoot 30 frames a second or even in the mechanical mode, 15 frames a second. So it's, it's you know, it's got that high frame rate. It's got that crop sensor. The, you know, obviously we can't draw full conclusions yet for a variety of reasons, but, um, you know, out in the field, I did do a little ISO test and I actually popped up a video on my YouTube channel. We can link to it. So if you guys want to see what the files look like, I did do a little testing and I compared the R7, the R5 in crop mode, the 7D Mark II and the 90D. All of those files shot from ISO 800 to ISO 12,800. So we'll link that below and you can check out at least the ISO performance. And as Yan said, we'll report back soon with a more detailed kind of truly what we think because it's been i've only had it for a few days yan doesn't even has his has his yet and when we have more to say we'll bring that information to you but i'm sure you can give us a little spoiler what it looked like compared to a 90d and i did feel like the r7 files did look a little bit better than the 90d Good. files one of the things that's a bit challenging right now is our we're in this mirrorless world now, and we're also in this like AI processing technology world. And even when it comes to the R5 or the R3, I can't imagine processing those files right now without DxO Pure Raw, to be honest. Yep. And this camera is not yet supported by DxO Pure Raw. So I can't even really truly process a file as I would process my R5 files. And one thing that I can definitely report is that it's awesome that this camera works really well with our pro sets as well. I was out shooting some black oyster catchers the other morning, some nice morning light, and I was like, oh, let's just see how our pro sets do. And sure enough, they again save me time, give me great results with just one click. That's awesome. It's great to see them even working with cameras that we haven't really designed them for, but they just do their magic on the raw files, help you to get to the right point with just one click. And if you're interested in those, make sure to check them out down there in the description. So what about you, Yan? I mean, I see from Instagram hang, hang, stories. Hang on a second. I think, I think the postman <laughs> is actually coming. I just quickly grabbed that camera. Okay, well, go, go get it then. Meanwhile, we just hang out, you guys and me, while Yan's off getting his camera or whatever he's doing. I could uh, sing you guys a song or tell you a story. I don't know. Uh, hmm. What songs do I know? Do I know any good oh. jokes? Oh. How's that for timing? Actually, good during timing. this show. That's I think it's an R7. I don't know. It's pretty light. I can open it quickly. Well, it's good that you got back quickly because I was just about to have to entertain the fans with a song. And no, my, I saved uh, everyone singing, from your singing Canadian voice. jokes. Yeah, that's true too. Let's see. Ba -ba -boom. There it is. There it is. Yeah, while well, you open that but up, now we really have no excuse. We will be back with a dedicated R7 episode to really talk about what both of us think after doing a bit more shooting. And we'll be back to you guys very soon with that. All right, here it is. It's 
definitely feels small. Like my pinky kind of doesn't know where to go. That's the totally. first impression. Yeah, exactly. I know it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of like one of those things, like I think for both of us, if we were to like keep this and keep it in our kit, you're probably going to be using it as a second body anyways. So maybe it's kind of nice that it's small in your bag and weight wise. And yeah, it's not ideal ergonomically for us, but it, it is nice and small and light. It actually feels nice in my hand. I must, you're right. That thumb wheel is exactly where your thumb is all the time. Yeah. So it can make sense. See how we go. But I must say I'm actually more positively surprised than what I <laughs> thought I would have been. Because I, when I did my previews without holding the camera, I know, I know, it's, you thought this is a bit funny, but it does feel yeah. okay for now. The main thing I felt like that star button is really far over on the right. So to use that, yeah. my thumb is making a bit of a weird bend. But let's yeah. see how we go. We're excited to use the camera. Yeah, enough about the R7. Jan, I've been seeing on Instagram that you have been road tripping up the coast of Queensland. And it looks like having some adventures along the way. Why don't you tell us where you are? You're up in Cairns now, right? Yes, I'm in Cairns. You can see the beautiful tropical palm trees there behind me. And it's been a great trip so far. It's been about two and a half weeks by now, I think. So we started at the Gold Coast just south of Brisbane and then made our way up, usually stopping two or three nights in different locations. Obviously, tailor-made to finding some bird species that I had to pick up. And so far, it's been really good. I basically have gotten photos of all my target species, which is really awesome. One of the main ones was, for instance, that Yangala honey eater. If you look at it in like a bird book, it's only like one tiny, tiny dot. It's only in that one sort of mountain range where it lives. So that's a cool bird. I thought I really want to get that one. Very challenging conditions, very dark. It was mainly at 12,800 or 25,600 eyes all because it was just dark rainforest. Got some nice cockatoos just feeding right at the roundabout. I was just driving back to the accommodation, didn't get any birds this morning. And then I'm driving around this really busy street and literally on the street, you see like a pile of nuts. You're the master of the roadside birding <laughs> opportunities, I think. We've seen this before. I mean, I must say it does make me feel a little uncomfortable. Many people, many cars, but this is actually where I like the 100 to 500, because if you drag your 600 mm. out, you're definitely the attraction of the town. Whereas with the 100 to oh, 500, yeah. you kind of have it between your legs on the ground, getting some nice low angle shots. It's a lot easier to kind of stay low key. And I got some nice shots there and they were driving up. So far, we've gotten some good stuff and the weather has been mainly okay as well. If I remember correctly from one of your recent stories, the weather did not look so okay. <laughs> But you were photographing a really spectacular bird. You've got to tell us the story about those crazy cassowaries. Totally. It's one bird that I always wanted to photograph. I've been here actually almost 10 years ago and I didn't get to see the birds at all. It's one spot in particular. There's like a caravan park and there's a beach. And for some reason, the cassowaries there are a lot more approachable. I assume people throw them some fruit or something as well. So they're more used to humans. And the unique thing is there that actually come out of the rainforest and walk along the beach and the edge of the beach. So you can actually get some nice shots because usually they're in the pretty dark, deep rainforest and it's not easy to get any sort of pleasant photos, let alone like a full body portrait where it doesn't have a million trees behind it. So it's actually quite an yeah. exciting opportunity, but until now, I'd never had any success there. Yeah, it's well, it certainly looked like you found them and it was some really cool videos there. But I have to say, it looked like it was pouring down rain. So how was that shooting in such really rough situation? Man, I must admit, I couldn't believe how bad luck we had. It was nice weather the whole time. And then the one time we stay right on the beach with the cassowaries. <laughs> It was pouring down for two days straight. It was over a hundred mil oh, of rain that came down in those Ooh. two days. So it's not just a little drizzle here and there. It's like no, that's, hammering down. And that's a downpour. Then you have two choices. Are you going to take photos or are you going to worry about the gear? And once I saw two cassowaries walking from the edge of the rainforest onto the beach, I'm like, screw the gear. I'm going to take some photos. And I did. And I think in those situations, this is why I pay a lot of money for this very expensive gear because I also wanted to work 
in the rain without braking and still delivering me good images. So in these situations, the gear really becomes a tool for me. I want to use the camera. I need to take photos of these birds. So I just expect the gear to work. So do you, did you have any covers with you? Were you trying to protect the gear at all or were you just going for it? I was basically going for it. Somewhere <laughs> I lost my, my shoes in the mud as well because it was so muddy <laughs> everywhere. I got stuck. So I was just barefoot in the rain. I do try to keep the top of the camera relatively dry. So I wipe that with my t-shirt from time to time, because whenever I had trouble with rain, it would always come in through the top buttons or the dial yeah. into the camera. So this is one area that I try to keep dry. So whenever the birds were like walking and I wasn't photographing, I tried to have it under my t-shirt, for instance, wiping the top of the t-shirt. And I mean, a lot of people always ask me, what about the 100 to 500 in the rain with the zoom? And all I can say is if I need to zoom back, I zoom back and I haven't had any trouble yet. If I can, of course, I'll wipe it down before zooming back. But if I'm in the rain, the cassowary is coming closer, I will zoom back and the lens never had any issues. The only issue I had for one day, the next day actually was there was a little bit of condensation in mm. the EVF just on that very front glass screen but that went away after day as well. And a friend of mine actually said he had that a few times. So he actually put like sort of insulation tape over the top of the EVF, like where that rubber connects to the camera. And since okay. then he didn't have any moisture in there either. So that might be a tip hmm. for you in the rainforest as well. Just kind of yeah. seal. That seems to be the weak point on the R5, the buttons. I'm happy to report. I didn't have any issue with water at all, but except for that little bit in the EVF. So okay, nice. So a little bit of a little bit of electrical tape just yep. over that. That's a that could be a good good little pro tip. Well, what matters though is did you get the photos you were after? Did you get some nice shots of those insane looking birds? One shot I definitely wanted to get was like a nice sort of upright head pose where you a see yeah. all that colored skin, the crazy horn on the head. I mean, it's an insane yeah. bird. It's literally like a dinosaur. And if you're a bird photographer and want to learn all about image editing, we would highly recommend that you check out our pro sets ebooks and masterclasses down there in the description. In these invaluable resources, we show you guys step by step exactly how we edit our images and it will help you to get better results, save time and learn a lot along the way. And with our pro sets, we enable you with just one click to transform your raw files. So if you want to get the absolute most out of your images, be sure to check out those resources down in the description. I was very happy to have that 100 to 500 because the challenge with these birds is they don't stop for you, right? They walk out of the rainforest. Yeah. They come there to eat these like beach almonds, or these kind of nuts. So they walk along the beach, pick a nut, throw it back and eat that nut. And then they keep walking and walking and walking. Like they hardly ever stop. So you yeah. kind of have to always reposition yourself in front of the birds. So they're kind of walking towards you. And then very quickly they walk past you and you just get bum shots. So you kind of always moving in the heavy rain but i think i got some really nice videos and photos in the end i was pretty happy with and i think it shows you as well that even in this horrible weather if you tough it out you can actually get some shots and what he means by that is if you're willing to trash your camera you can you too can achieve excellent results in the rain i mean i found another two cassowaries later that day on the beach but i literally walked up and down the beach in the crazy rain for probably two hours camera under my t-shirt a towel on my pants no, I... drying my face drying my camera and i got some more shots so it was it was a tough one <laughs> it's great but it's great to hear that the r5 handled that just with a minor issue but that's great to hear now another reason why you probably wouldn't want to be having to use the 70 to 200 lens is that those birds do have a bit of a reputation. If I'm not mistaken, they have actually like kicked people and I think even killed people in the past, these cassowaries, those reports. So were you at all concerned about, you know, being close to these birds or how did you feel about being in these magnificent beasts presence? Well, maybe it's a bit naive, but I'm not really scared of any birds. And I think if you understand birds and you can write, kind of read body language and what the birds are doing, you can be near a bird like that as well and it's relatively safe like it's not just gonna out of nowhere while it's eating a nut kick you in the guts and kill you like there will <laughs> always be some sort of body language like it will 
stand up suddenly or will stop or will look at you or it will fluff up a little bit and then obviously you would try to get out of its way but it's also important that you're not just running after it jumping right in front of it blocking kind of the way it wants to go like you always want to yeah. give it a path where it can easily walk past you maybe if you're in the rainforest there's a dad with three little babies and it's not used to people it's a different story but we also saw a pair not a pair actually the dad because the mum doesn't care about the babies with cassaries a dad and the baby on the street driving into that place and they were actually coming to the car window literally sticking their head into the car window so now we've talked so much about me and my road trip but you've been on a road trip as well and i think you just came back home and how was it did you get some nice images yeah so i just got back last week from a six week road trip across canada from victoria all the way to ottawa and back 12,000 kilometers was my trip. Not bad. In total, so a lengthy drive. Yeah, it was a long one. <laughs> but today, I think we can start maybe by talking about the initial phase when I was in what we call the Prairie Pothole region. And this is an area in, in southern Manitoba especially, where there's just tons of these little lakes. And this is where a lot of species of waterfowl go to find somewhere to breed. And it's just an amazing area. So why don't we jump out to the field and see what I got up to out in the prairie potholes. One of the things is when I think about waterfowl photography, I think of kind of two different approaches. And I lean strongly to the one, which is to get as low as possible, always with, with wildlife, with any kind of photography, you want to try to get at eye level with your subject. Well, a little duck, he's only about this high off the water, which means that's where I want my camera to be. Sometimes you can approach a pond and it's got a nice flat bank and you can just lay down on the edge of the pond and take great shots. That's wonderful when you can do that. It certainly makes it a lot easier. But a lot of these ponds are lined with cattails. There's absolutely no way that you could be on the edge of the pond and get any kind of satisfactory shot. So what does that mean? It means you're going to have to get in the pond. So I'll talk more about that in a second. The other way I sometimes like to photograph waterfowl, if you have a really calm, calm water, then I don't mind sometimes a bit of a higher perspective because it allows you to get that nice reflection on the water. So sometimes that can be really cool too. But back to getting in the pond. Now that's more like it. Pretty stylish too, eh? Viewer, you know, warning, warning advised here. You definitely want to be careful and, and really make sure you know what you're doing, but the results can be truly spectacular and definitely worth the effort. Once you're in the pond like this, the birds don't really seem that shy of me. They, I'm sure they can see me, but they don't really seem to care. And I've had northern shovelers, redheads, canvasbacks, ruddy ducks, greater scops, blue wing teal, gadwall, American coot, horned grebe, all swimming around right in front of me. It's just incredible. So let me get this straight. There's this open plain, no trees that cast shade onto the water, beautiful low sunlight, not too much wind, and all these amazing duck species. That's just crazy, isn't it? Sometimes it was like, I don't even know what to shoot. Like they're all kind of right in front of me. The conditions are perfect. And, but then other times, like I was really wanting to improve my images, which actually, this is funny because when Yan and I first met, the first bird we ever photographed together was... A canvas back. Exactly. On the famous golden pond. The golden pond. And those were some really nice shots, but I kind of wanted, you know, in that pond, we couldn't get like super low. Yeah. And so I did kind of want to improve those shots. And so I was really trying to, to find some of them, but they were really shy. Sometimes I would just pull my car up by a pond and they would just like kind of like look at you and be like, well, we're out of here. And they would take off. So for those guys, I did have to kind of be a little bit more stealthy and kind of get the right, the, really the right spot to try to get shots of those guys. So Glenn, ducks are nice, but can you please tell us now how we can win this hummingbird book? All right, guys, <laughs> if you want a free copy of my new hummingbirds book, what we want you to do, of course, you have to like the video. And we want you down in the comments to tell us either what is your favorite species of hummingbird or tell us about like a favorite encounter you had, something really special that, that really made you fall in love with hummingbirds. Tell us down in the comments and we will pick randomly a winner and we'll announce it in the next episode and get in contact with you on YouTube. And also make sure to subscribe to the channel. All right, guys. Well, I think that just about does it for this episode. 
and we hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you've enjoyed hearing about the R7. Another thing you can let us know down in the comments is what do you want Yan and I to look into with the R7? What kinds of things do you want us to test out and report back on? So let us know about what, how we can help you make a decision if this is the right camera for you. But as always, thank you so much for watching and we will see you in our next episode. See you soon, guys.